Okay, well, people ask me, what was it like to work for these two men? George Bush, and then two and a half years later, uh, this, there was an, uh, an opening on the president's staff. Somebody had left. And uh, one by one, the speechwriters for the president came to me and said, we think you should be the man, the guy, the person. And uh, things happened, and I was. And for the next two and a half years, I worked for Ronald Reagan. So two and a half years for George Bush, two and a half years for Ronald Reagan. Um, one thing to note is a vice president is different from a president, as I described. You're personally much closer to the vice president because it's a small staff, less close to the president, but every word that you write for the president is national policy. That's not true of every word you write for the vice president. Uh, but each of these men, who I did come to know, um, were tremendously gracious, tremendously public-spirited, tremendously capable, tremendously clear about, their, uh, about, about what they wanted to do for the nation and the world and why they wanted to do it. It was terrific. It was an honor working for them. They also had their standards. Uh, one of the standards common to them was tight writing. Do you know what I mean by tight writing? Not a lot of extra words. Not, don't go on forever. Don't, uh, uh, you have, uh, Pres Vice President Bush was very clear, you have this much time, and I don't want a speech that goes on farther. Now that became a problem, because he would ad lib at the top of speeches. He would just make things up. He'd recognize people in the audience, He'd go on for as long as the speech was to go on, and then he'd wonder why the speech was too long. And so after a time, I started taking a stopwatch. And I'd do what if you were a, ra a runner or in um, bicycling, which is what I did as in school, one of the, my sports, uh, you would call a split. And you'd stop the watch once, and, and you'd uh, stop watches. We'll do this. And then uh, when he was done with his ad-libbing, and then stop it for the full and have the two. And I'd give these, uh, the uh, splits to him. And after that, he started keeping in his, his space, the ad-lib space. And the speeches went on just right. But if they didn't, before when he'd get a speech, he'd weigh it in his hand, and he'd say, pretty heavy, Clark. <laughs> At which point I'd go back and start cutting. Uh, the president, when he was, when I was first writing to, for him, and there were several writers who went through this, actually I think almost everyone did, uh, got a, um, uh, I got a speech back from him. And he'd cut out about every fifth word. Not one full sentence, but he was cutting adverbs, adjectives, he was simplifying, he was tightening. And at the, top, at the top of the front page, he said, well, that's a Reagan imitation, by the way. You can laugh at it. <laughs> this, this is a very fine speech. <laughs> I've just sweated a little of the fat out of it. <laughs> by which he was saying, I want tight writing, too. And if you think of the way he phrased that, very fine speech, sweated a little of the fat. You get some uh, little glimmer of Ronald Reagan's character. He was criticizing, but he, uh, it was criticizing, or at least correcting, but not criticizing, praising as he was correcting. And he, was, he spoke and wrote in a very vivid way, metaphors, similes, images, sweated a little of the fat out of it. Now, people ask, how are the two different from one another? What are presidential speech styles? And I'll give you one, uh, first something about President Reagan's delivery, and then about the styles of the two men, and actually every president since President Reagan. 
On style of delivery, um, I'll, I'll give you a contrast of the two men. On style of delivery, one of the, it's very different writing a speech for someone, particularly if he's very gifted as a, as a presenter, as a uh, speaker, than uh, um, uh, just listening as you're listening to me. Uh, the first, in one of my early speeches for President Reagan, was in a room, um, an audience somewhat larger than this. We had a small auditorium in the White House, a bit like a, a classroom, okay? Uh, um, auditorium, meaning the rear seats were higher than the next seats and on down, and a little stage, and you could have a classroom in it, a class in it. And um, I, I was in the back, as I usually was, and I had written in this speech a particular sentence, and I couldn't even tell you what the sentence is now. I can tell you what I heard. It was very clear what the sentence meant in its simplest form. What it, when it came out of the president's mouth, the same words were there, and the meeting was totally different. Inflection, balance, con the tone, he had peered into the speech and teased out a different meaning. In other words, he had a tremendous sensitivity to language. And this is something I've found with men who are at the top ranks of, at least in, uh, I've been accustomed, I've been uh, close to. Tremendous sensitivity for language. That comes through in senior men in, in the last five presidents in different ways. Because I, I say that because I think of presidential speech writing in Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, and Obama in terms of music. Reagan was symphonic. Every variation of tempo, of emotion, of meaning, conviction, intensity, humor, he could handle. President H.W. Bush was rock and roll. <laughs> now, I like symphonies and I like rock and roll, but they're different. Rock and roll, simple driving beats, a, so, a lot of power in it. And by the way, I said that um, about Reagan's uh, delivery, Bush's delivery was like, uh, reflected that. And he had picked it up, I believe, from his early experiences, which had to do with small halls, not unlike this, in towns all over Texas. And that's how you speak in that environment. Now, President Clinton was like improvisational jazz. You know the saxophone? <laughs> that's him. Brilliant riffs. Not all of them lined up with one another. But brilliant in themselves, and often it was improvised. Um, I, I said this, by the way, once. I've said it several times when I've been on podiums together with uh, Clinton speechwriters, and they have each time said, well, actually, we called sections of speeches riffs. They had sensed that. Uh, this, and so this, this, what I'm describing is not the way they had put it together, but they had sensed that there was something jazz-like about his speaking. Now, I'll tell you also, Bill Clinton had a second style, which was for campaigning. Do you know the Hank Williams song, Jambalai? It's a kind of good time song meant to be in Cajun. Uh, Cajun is a group in uh, southern Louisiana known, known par primarily for partying. Then there's George W. Bush, country music. Very strong structure, right? 
note of evangelical lyricism. You know what they say about country music? You always have God, gun, and your mother. <laughs> I, I'm not so sure that that's in every part of George W. Bush's speeches. <laughs> but that's, you can see that, right? And Barack Obama, as president, he also, like Clinton, has presidential and a kind of campaign style. The presidential style is urban jazz. You know those long pauses? That's Miles Davis. Yes? Right? And that tempo, which sometimes is slow, and then that's, that's urban jazz at its highest. The um, campaign style, if you think of, if you saw his speech in, uh, on the night of his reelection in 2012 from, Grant, I think it was Grant Park in Chicago. That's almost like gospel music. That you almost want to say, amen, amen. And in fact, people were saying amen. amen. <laughs> and and th it's that kind of energy. So you see that in each of these. Now, I won't say anything about the current group of presidents, the presidential candidates. <laughs> no, I won't, no. <laughs> uh, I, I can't be bought, but I can be rented. Anyway. <laughs> but I will say one thing common to them all. I'm still looking for the music. <laughs> but at this very high level of speaking, personality and speaking style and musical form somehow have merged. And I think that's a clue into both, uh, not just American presidents, it's, I'm sure it's true in other places too, but uh, someone who has that sensitivity to language. That, sensitive, that internalization of what he's saying with, what it, with the culture. So that is a tremendous part of speech writing, that mediation, negotiation, reporting, figuring out where the parts of the government are and where the president would want to be. When he returned from Reykjavik, uh, this is the capital of Iceland, as you know, and there was a summit there, a kind of flash summit and when he returned from that, uh, where Ms. Uh, he and Gorbachev were talking about eliminating nuclear weapons and Gorbachev wanted uh, missile defense gone, when he returned from that, he wrote the much of the speech he gave to the country that night himself, specifically the portions that had to do with his direct discussions with Gorbachev. How, people ask, has presidential speech writing changed? Well, it's, since I left the White House, it's never been so good. <laughs> uh, but uh, in fact, there are some important changes. In um, 1988, one of the American magazines said, ran a cover story that showed the length of a average sound bite, that's the clip of the president speaking or a candidate speaking, in 1968 and 1988. In 1968, it was 82 seconds. That is to say, um, a minute and 22 seconds, right? Pretty long. In 1988, it was eight seconds. So the question was, how can you get your meaning through in eight seconds? And if you're going to be giving speeches and other things. How do you phrase those speeches so that the news people, the editors, the film editors, the copy editors, the reporters, they take that eight seconds? because the eight seconds they take will either determine whether your message gets through or it does not. 
I had some rules. I won't go through all of them with you, but one of them was uh, give it a name. If you can give an idea a name, Star Wars, right? What about Star Wars? It's a name for concept. Second is it's tied to popular culture. If you can give a name or anything tied to popular culture. Um, third is it's an image. It's kind of metaphor. If you can tie, use a metaphor tied to popular culture, giving a name. Now not everything's a name. A contrast, not this but this. American President uh, John F. Kennedy is known for a phrase with a contrast. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Not this, but this. There's a professor at Oxford, who used to be at Oxford, uh, uh, went out on his own after this because he was so successful at writing sound bites, <laughs> speeches. He's a communications advisor now. Who uh, did a formal study of sound bites. He called them clap traps because people would automatically clap whenever these came along. And uh, one of the uh, language forms, an anthropologist, you know, and socio, uh, one of the language forms was contrast. Another was a series of three um, Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. You've heard that. Put those together. Not this, not this, but this. The press will take you. If you keep it under eight seconds. Do you leave here today and ask yourself, do I remember one word he said? The answer is yes, and don't you forget it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but do I remember one word he said? And there will be things you remember. I don't know what they'll be. There'll probably be an image. There'll be a story. People remember stories. And there'll be a phrase. And on that, you'll build your memory of what was said here. Same thing in your classrooms, particularly if you're not taking notes. No, I know everybody here takes notes. <laughs> and your job in writing speeches is to figure out what it is that will stay in people's minds, to write brightly, to write strongly, to have memorable phrases, to have stories, to have lots and lots of hooks for pe and to have a tight argument. But an argument often built on stories. Why do you have statistics? Statistics are a story. Quotes are a story. These are all ways of hanging on to things that are real in people's minds. Linking as much as you can to their experience in ways that have, are concrete and real and drive uh, the, not just the speech, but their memory. Humor is tough in speeches. A lot of people ask about it. There's a story you can tell. I'm about to tell you a joke. <laughs> There's a story about Christ walking down a road. Comes upon a man sitting by the road, and the man is crying. And Christ stoops down with him and he says, my son, why are you crying? He says, because I am blind and I cannot see. Christ says, that's no reason to cry. He lays on his hands, the man's eyes open up, the light comes in, he sees, he jumps up, he says, thank you, Lord, thank you, and he runs into town to cry, to tell his friends. So Christ walks a little further, another man, sitting by a road crying. These things always have three, you know, you know, you get setups. Anyway, my son, why are you crying? Because I am crippled and I cannot walk. That's no reason to cry. He lays on his hands. Man's legs come alive. He jumps up and he runs into town to tell his friends. This is coming to number three. You can guess, you know? Third man, farther down the road. Third time crying. My son, why are you crying? Because I'm a speechwriter and I can't think of any jokes. <laughs> <laughs> he 
So Christ sat down and cried with him. <laughs> Uh, Charlie Chaplin once said, you want to know what humor is? Humor is a woman is walking towards the camera. This is the camera, right? All right, so you'll just have to imagine this. She's walking towards the camera. There's a banana peel. The camera cuts to it. Cuts back to the woman. She's still walking towards the camera. Cuts back to the banana peel. She's still walking, then cuts back to the woman. She's still walking towards the camera. She, just as she's about to step on the banana peel, she sees it. She steps to the side, and she drops down a manhole that no one had seen, not even her. <laughs> that, Charlie Chaplin said, is humor. Put it in a phrase. Set up, set up, twist. That's humor. But I will tell you the uh, story of perhaps the greatest speech given by Ronald Reagan during his presidency, and not one I wrote. I'll talk to you about who it was. And that was Tear Down This Wall. Um, the president was going to Berlin. This was 1987. Every presidential Ta uh, um, trip is really three trips. There's a planning trip, a um, setup trip, and then the actual trip of the president. It's called the pre-advance, the advance, and the trip, okay? And on the pre-advance, the speechwriter, a fellow named Peter Robinson, is one of the founders of the White House Writers Group, which I, I uh, manage, as you, as you heard. Um, he was a graduate of Oxford, and uh, he was graduate of Dartmouth undergraduate in Oxford, graduate work. And um, he was sent on the trip. And uh, gets, to, gets to Berlin, and he did what I just described, or what I described earlier. First question, who has the policy? in this area for the US government. Who is the senior man in Berlin, right? You consult, right? Well, the senior man in Berlin and he meet. And that man says, don't mention the wall. <laughs> I won't say his name, but today he takes credit for the speech, which is the way people do in Washington. It's a great thing. Um, the uh, Berliners uh, are accustomed to it. They feel that the president is a cowboy, Germans do, and uh, they're, they're, you don't, don't stir the waters. That night, one of his Oxford friends says, uh, has, arranged, has arranged with a woman in Berlin to uh, have a dinner party for him. After uh, cocktails and getting to know one another, they sit down and they uh, start to talk and he makes some introductory remarks and they get going and then he asks, uh, he, he says, uh, interrupts and says, well, I, um, I was told today that we shouldn't mention the wall, that no one cares about it. What do you think? And um, a man sitting at um, a little bit down the table says, um, my sister grew up 25 miles to the east. I haven't seen her since the wall went up, what do you, which I think at that time was 25 years. What do you think I think about the wall? And another man says, Every day I go to work and I see a young man in a guard tower with an AK-47 and I think this is a zoo. I don't know who's the animal and who's the zookeeper. And um, finally the hostess for the evening, a woman who just passed away a year ago, 
says, Mr. Gorbachev is serious about glasnost and perestroika, the words for um, reform and change. Um, he'll come here and he'll, he'll remove the wall. So Peter takes this back to Washington and w uh, working with the chief speechwriter, they draft the speech and that and the call for the removal of the wall is at the center of it. Uh, they worked a lot on the phrasing. At one point the phrasing was in German and at another point it was something a little more drawn out. And the, he, he, Peter settled on Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Very simple, very direct, nothing ambiguous. Goes into what's called staffing. That's what I described earlier, where people around the government get to, uh, get to uh, who are, have policy involvement, get, uh, are asked to comment. Because you're speaking for the government, right? The government has to be behind it. And, um, and the uh, State Department wants it out. And there's a big fight. And the fight, uh, they come back and they come back with alternate drafts. And every draft, they've taken out the phrase, taken out the sentence, taken out the call. And they keep coming back. And they, uh, uh, Peter and the um, communications director, uh, try to work in things they can um, uh, give to state. I went through something similar a little while after this, also regarding the Soviets and also regarding a call to action. And um, they, uh, they try to give them what they can. And if you actually read the speech, the first speech, re uh, half of the speech reach, uh, goes up to the climax of that phrase. And the second half has to do with a lot of diplomatic business, which they uh, was part of, it was basically what they gave them to but the state keeps wanting it back. The secretary, um, actually, I forgot to mention one thing to you. This interrupts the flow of this story, but, but it's important. Most presidential speeches go the way I just described. They go, the speechwriter wrote, and then it went into staffing, and then the staffing issues are worked out, and then it goes to the president. Right, the mediation and negotiation I described, not this one. You might think that this springing of a new thing might have had some been planned. No, I just forgot. <laughs> anyway, um, president got to see the speech before anyone else did. And we were brought in under the guise of a speech uh, um, meeting and uh, a lot of speeches were uh, brought up and then it got to the Berlin Wall speech and Mr. President, um, <coughs> as Peter said, uh, I've been told that if radio con air, uh, atmospheric conditions work, are right, that they'll be able to hear that, this speech all through Eastern Europe here mm -hmm. and all the way to Moscow. Anything you want to say about the speech, about the draft? He said, well. <laughs> Some, you guys in back need to laugh more. <laughs> that, that line about the wall, that should stay in. The point of that is that the president knew beforehand there was going to be a fight. And he laid down a marker that whatever you give up, whatever you surrender, it's going to be your fight so long as we can keep it as your fight. But whatever you lay down and whatever you surrender, you're not going to surrender that. So pick up the story. The secretary, finally, uh, as much can, as can be done, and, and then it gets appealed by the Secretary of State to the president. The president says no again. Comes to the day before the speech. And the... Um, <clears throat> this trip was part of the uh, G7 summit of that year. The G7 was meeting, that's the, uh, at that time, that was the seven uh, leaders, uh, economic powers. They met, the leaders met every year. I think now it's G3 
3,234. <laughs> uh, but um, then it was only seven. They had nothing to talk about. They were waiting for the others to come. But, and it was in Venice, in a Venetian palace. And you know, there, there's a central garden. And the president, this is the day before, and the president's working on papers in the garden. And the deputy chief of staff, who was traveling with him, comes, his name is Ken Duberstein, comes to the president and he says, Mr. President, state is back. They really want that line out. The president looks up from his papers. Well, Ken. I am the president, aren't I? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. And uh, that does mean I get to make these decisions, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're all clear about that. Then it stays in. And in the in limousine, on the way to the speech in uh, Berlin, he slapped Ken on the knee and said, the boys at State are going to kill me for this, but it's the right thing to do. What am I saying? I've talked to you about technique. It's not technique. I've talked to you about negotiation. It's negotiation, mediating. It's also technique. But what it really is is conviction. A speechwriter is sharing, is carrying a torch. And if he's carrying the torch of the same of his principal, and that's a person of conviction and strength, then there is no better job in the world. Thank you.